Dr. Summer completed his undergraduate training in molecular biology and chemistry at Vanderbilt University. He studied medicine at the University of Tennessee and performed his pediatric residency and genetics postdoctoral fellowship back at Vandy, where he joined the faculty in 1990. His research has been in uh, the gene mapping fields, rare inborn errors metabolism, and translational work around carrying concepts from rare disease to more common medical conditions. He is the uh, immediate past president of the Society for Inherited Metabolic Disorders, chairs the National Organization of Rare Diseases Board of Directors, and directs the Rare Disease Institute, formerly known as the Genetics and Metabolism Division here at Children's National. He has experience with the modern genomic era, having been part of the Human Genome Project's editorial board and working with the development of the molecular genetics labs, both at Vanderbilt and here at Children's National. He has also worked with the CDC and the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics on the uses of testing in the clinic and in newborn screening. Today, he'll be speaking to us about genetic testing in a post-genome world, a user's guide. Dr. Summer. All right, yep, it's coming over just fine. Thank you very much. Stephen, thank you for that introduction. I wish you'd done the one about being a poor toothless doctor from Tennessee, but we'll work that one in next time. So first thing I want to say is I don't have any conflicts for this talk. The next thing I want to say is pretty much everything I'm going to tell you today in two to three years will be obsolete or wrong. And actually six months might actually be the half-life for some of this information, the way the field goes. I'd like to put a thanks out to Sandesh Nagamani, Carlos Ferreira, Chris Austin, Reed Sutler and the folks at Baylor, Carlos, the folks at NIH, Christina Cusmano, who runs the Molecular Diagnostics Lab here, Natasha Schur, Google Images, and the Center for Disease Control, all for providing information for this talk today. I've tried to make this one as up-to-date as we can get it. Uh, this is what we would like you to think of as genetic testing. This is a Bugatti Chiron. It can top out at 260 miles an hour and go from 0 to 60 in 2.5 seconds. This is actually where genetic testing is. This is a Bruce Mopetta, which has a top speed of 22 miles per hour, but does get 120 miles per gallon. The pipe is optional. But this is kind of where we are. We have a practical uh, test that we can use in a lot of clinical situations, but I think we tend to overcall what it will actually do. Why do you do any test? Well, one is to determine or improve treatment, determine or rule out a diagnosis, determine prognosis is another reason. Determine risk for others, as well as the person doing the test themselves. Determine reproductive risk. That's one of the big things, obviously, in genetics, is we want to know the effect on future generations. Um, understand what the future may bring by understanding a diagnosis at a molecular level. We may be able to make some predictions about how a patient will do in the future or respond in the future. The other thing, though, and this one's a little bit of an intangible, is closure to the search. We have a lot of families who have literally spent years, sometimes decades, trying to find a diagnosis, trying to find out why they or their loved one has a particular problem. Sometimes through molecular genetic testing, we can bring that search to an end, and then they can move on with dealing with the problems they have. Genetic testing can actually help with all of these. What are some of the test selection factors? Now, I am not a specialist in laboratory medicine. I've worked in labs, and I've worked in molecular genetic labs a good bit of my life. so. I know enough for that, but I will apologize to the folks who actually do CLIA laboratories, run them, know the rules, and all those things in case I step out of bounds on any of this. But some of the test selection factors in genetics are information quality, cost, utility information. Do you get something back in a time that it can be useful and in a form that you can actually use it to make decisions? The ability to process the information, do you get something back that you can understand? You know, if I sent you a whole genome, with three billion bases of DNA in it, that wouldn't necessarily be particularly useful. Uh, and then time to result. Do you get it in a time to actually make utility of it in a clinical setting? Genetic testing is an outer crossroads. Historically, it's been for rare diseases, and that's still its primary use. It's for conditions that we would list as um, being rare, things under 200,000 patients, things like that. But now it's actually becoming common in a number of fields. And to me, actually, uh, the most exciting one is not in my field. It's actually in the field of infectious disease. The ability to use molecular genetic techniques to diagnose viruses and bacteria rapidly and in almost real time, I think, is revolutionizing the use of antibiotics, 
the treatment of our patients, potentially with sepsis. A lot of these things that before we would have to wait days and or weeks before we would have answers for. It's also become very big in the cancer field. It's now being used to actually determine. So cancer always seems to be ahead of everybody else. And I don't know if they're well-funded or what, or they're just more insightful than we are, but they're using DNA testing now to determine the types of cancer a patient has, the best appropriate treatments, the likelihood of response and the likelihood of resistance based on genetic uh, testing of the tumor cells themselves as well as the patient. It's starting to come into its own in drug metabolism, the response to different drug drugs, fast metabolizers, slow metabolizers. This has been a slow rollout. I think people thought this would actually be more used than it currently is. Part of the problem there is filling in the back data. To actually do pharmacokinetics on patients given different genetic variations is difficult to do. Obviously, in the nursery, you look for aminoglycosides that can damage hearing. That's one thing you can look for there. Cancer is another field. People are looking at this in the field of epilepsy. So a number of places that's being used now. And then forensics, those of us old enough to remember the OJ trials and DNA uh, blots being held up in court and people trying to make some sense out of does the DNA match this and that. But another thing that's coming along, though, is uh, risk assessment and personalized medicine. You'll see ads out there that test your DNA and determine your health future. The problem is a little bit of a disconnect. They'll say, well, test your DNA, and then you're going to live forever. That step in between where you get to the live forever part is a little unclear right now, but that's certainly something that you'll see a lot of ads for. And then there's what we call recreational genetics. Those are things like Ancestry.com, uh, the National Geographic Project, and those are kind of fun. I'll actually show you some results from one of those studies today so you can actually be incredibly surprised that my ancestry is Northern European. <laughs> so two types of testing you deal with, reactive and predictive or proactive. Reactive is the one we standardly use. Something's wrong. You need to understand the pathophysiology of a disease. You're reacting to a clinical situation you're presented with where the utility of that information will help you make decisions. The other is what we call predictive or proactive. You may not have a problem yet, but you want to know if you're going to have one in the future. For instance, are you going to be able to metabolize a drug? Are you at uh, high risk for a type of cancer? Are you at high risk for a type of epilepsy? Do you have the same change as someone else in the family that's given them a disease like Marfan syndrome, Huntington's disease, things like that? So we really are using both. I would say the predictive is a little less developed than the reactive. The reactive is typically what most modern medical uh, situations are built around but predictive is coming along more and more. Some reasons to test. So why do you, we typically do genetic tests? If you look at the tests in here at Children's, patients with multiple congenital anomalies is typically the most common one. The yield on that when you look between chromosomes, molecular microarray and everything, is somewhere between 60 and 80 percent. So it's actually quite high as test results go. Patients with severe developmental delay or autism, the yields on that can be as high as 40%, tend to average around 30%. Patients with inborn errors of metabolism, why do we go, you know, if we know biochemically what that patient has, why do we go through and sequence them? Actually, you can use that for uh, the next patient coming along. You can also use it for doing a little bit of prediction around severity of disease. You'll get about an 80% yield on those. Familial deafness actually has a very high yield. 40 to 60% of those patients will have a um, molecular defect that we can identify. And then, of course, cancer tissues and family cancers kind of depends on the cancer. Some have a very high penetrance. When you look at individual tumor cells, it's very likely to find genetic changing in those. That's one of the reasons they turn into tumor cells in the first place. All right, this, unfortunately, slightly busy slide, but there's a reason I show you this slide. This tells you when we start looking at the human genome, first off, it's complex. Remember, a diploid human genome is about six billion bases. You know, half from mom, half from dad. Um, when you look at what it's made up of, though, see that little red part right there? That's the exomes. So they're less than one and a half percent of your DNA. So the things that actually encode all of the proteins that you make and use, the things that typically go wrong, and 85 percent of the mutations we find actually live in those exomes. So when we start talking about sequencing, most of the heterochromatin, the transposon elements, um, the other sequences, not that they aren't important, we just don't really have a great idea what they do, and they tend to not be the places where we find a lot of the mutations. 
So the part that we actually are concerned most with when we're sequencing DNA is in those exons and in those little related regions right around there, the RNA genes and regulatory sequences. So when we're dealing with the, uh, what I'd say, the pathologic human genome, we're actually dealing with less than 2% of it. Now, when I started in the field in 1987, well, actually 1985 is when I started, we could accurately diagnose with molecular testing under a dozen diseases, and those were typically cytogenetic ones like Down syndrome, things like that. We can now accurately diagnose over 6,000 diseases, and the number grows literally every week as new genetic changes are matched up with phenotypes. Now, that sounds great until you realize we've only got therapies for about 500 of those. So we can diagnose a lot of things that we can't necessarily do something. That 500 therapy is based on the number of FDA approved treatments for rare disease conditions. We can do a lot of things for other patients. We don't really cure very many of these things, but we can at least react to a lot of them. So right now, our, was it our reach exceeds our grasp? We can diagnose a lot of things, but not necessarily do as many things about them as we would like. And that's one of the big pushes in the field now is to start to try to get these things to match up. Just in case you get a little bit smug about the human genome with our 24,000 genes, tomatoes have 31,000 genes. And the water flea also has 31,000 genes. It's the animal with the largest number of genes. Tomatoes actually duplicated their genome, and then the genes diverged. They have 31,000 distinct genes. So we're not as complex as a tomato. <laughs> So what kind of things can we look for when we do testing? We can look, obviously, at DNA sequence. We can look to make sure you've got the right number of those exons. We can look at chromosome copy number. That actually goes back to 1957 and the ability to do a karyotype. We can look at rearrangements in those chromosomes. And then we can actually look at something that's kind of subtle. So as a geneticist from Tennessee, are there any other Tennesseans in the audience? Okay, good. I can say this then with impunity. Um, they won't report me back. Uh, basically, sometimes people tend to share the same set of genes again and again and again in small haulers and valleys back in Tennessee. And so you end up with areas where the DNA is basically come from the same person by descent. We call it identity by descent, and you'll see areas of homozygosity. This has actually proved quite useful in modern genetic testing when we're looking for autosomal recessive disease. We look for the parts that come from a unique ancestor. So we look for areas of homozygosity. We can look at mitochondrial DNA. We can look at methylation changes. Geneticists love to do hand-wavy things. We use the words epigenetics, kind of like um, you know we sprinkle it on all of our food in the day. And we use that to explain anything we don't really understand. A lot of this has to uh, tie back to the fact that we methylate our DNA and that different tissues will shut down or turn on different bits of DNA. And then when we pass that on to the next generation, the methylation of that DNA is different coming from the mother or the father, even for the same gene. So some regions will come inactivated or activated from the parent and not from the other parent. So that's one of the things we'll do, use when we don't quite know what's going on. So this kind of a, think of a lot of DNA testing as a matter of resolution. So the karyotype, which was introduced in 1956, they finally got the count of chromosomes right in 1957. It's been around for a very long time. That's like a satellite photo. I can tell you all the continents are there. I can tell you most of the oceans are there. If India had broken off and attached to the Horn of Africa, I could probably figure that out from looking at it. But it's not going to have a lot more resolution for that. But this is a test that's been around a long time. The price has come down pretty significantly. And if you rapidly want to know if a patient has Down syndrome, trisomy 18, trisomy 13, and a pinch, it's still not a bad test. Chromosome microarray, which was introduced in 1992, note the 1992 font uh, there, that's higher resolution. That's where we take a number of small probes, hybridize it with the DNA, and see if there are any pieces that are missing or duplicated. So it's actually quite reliable. Most of the microarray probe kits now have about 3 million fragments in them. So you can actually get fairly high resolution man mapping. So that'd be looking at our satellite picture and saying, okay, Children's is there and most of the wings of the hospital are still attached. That's actually an orbital picture um, from satellite of Children's National Medical Center. And then we get to DNA sequence. Now, oh, sorry, one other thing we can do with chromosome microarrays is we now include genetic variants in those little probes. So we can actually use the probes now to look for those areas of homozygosity where 
the DNA kind of looks the same coming from the parents. And that's actually a very useful tool that we do now. DNA sequence, we've opened up your sock drawer. We're looking to see if you have two pairs of all the socks and that they match. And we're actually looking to see which socks you know, are mismatched or which ones um, might actually be the wrong one. So that's very high resolution with what we can do. The problem is, is sometimes when you're missing one sock, you never know where the other one is. I have to, the union rules that I show you a picture of a karyotype. Uh, this one is obviously trisomy 21. This was a brief lived but actually beautiful technique called uh, painting or chromosome painting. This is this guy where they basically developed probes for each chromosome that had a unique color. You stain the chromosomes, and that's actually not color enhanced. That's what they look like under the microscope. It's actually quite lovely and also completely obsolete now. The workhorse currently in molecular genetics is the microarray. That probably has the highest yield, is the easiest to get done. As I said, the current version has about 3 million markers. We use it primarily in patients with dysmorphology, developmental delay, uh, looking for areas of homozygosity or identity by descent. Uh, it's quite useful in autism, multiple, and a multiple number of other defects as well as cancer patients. It'll miss a few things since it's a molecular technique. You don't actually visualize the chromosomes. So if a piece is broken off and swapped with another chromosome, you'll miss a balanced translocation. You'll also miss small mutations at the molecular level because it's just not that high resolution. You have to go to sequencing for that. The yield nationally is about 5 to 10%. The technique basically is you take normal, and whenever I use the word normal, please mentally put quotes around it because no one knows really what normal DNA is. Everyone's different, so there's no real actual standard, but just think of normal DNA. You mix it with your patient's DNA, hybridize it to a chip that actually has pretty much all these little probes on it, and then you look to see if both bound or one bound and didn't bound, and the color difference allows you to see if areas are you know, duplicated in excess or missing in that. So it's pretty sensitive in that regard. Uh, here we do a little bit better yield. The yield at children's is between 20 and 30 percent. Uh, well, most of those come through the genetics division here, so I would say it's a highly selected population that goes on to testing. That also means our cost per diagnosis tends to be a little bit lower for these things as well. This is some data from Christina Cusmano in the molecular lab on 668 consecutive patients. We're a very high volume genetics program here, so we tend to do a lot of molecular testing. So we actually have quite good data on <clears throat> how useful it is. And what you can find is you find a lot of different things. Um, we'll find uh, duplications in about 54, deletions, complex aneuploidies. But what's really interesting is about 6% uh, of the patients will have those identity by descent or those areas of large homozygosity, which means we need to be looking for an autosomal recessive condition. So that's one of the reasons we do a lot of these tests. So whenever people talk about sequencing, it's kind of like, where's my air car? Uh, geneticists are obviously a little bit bad about overhyping our stuff, which is why we're all treating all diseases with gene therapy right now. Um, Sequencing is kind of the same. We tend to oversell it a little bit, but it's incredibly useful in dysmorphology, particularly if you suspect a single gene disorder in a condition. It's also useful in conditions like epilepsy, cancer, arrhythmia, skeletal dysplasia, metabolic diseases, and what I would say then is the, I don't know what else to do, so I'm going to do large-scale sequencing because that will take a couple of months to complete, and then maybe I'll get an answer and maybe I won't. When we talk about scales of testing for sequence, you can go down to the single level. For instance, if I'm looking at a patient with sickle cell, I'm only looking at one gene and one variant I'm looking for. Uh, cystic fibrosis, things like that, I'll be doing a few more genes. I'll do a panel there for a couple of things. But I'll be looking for a bunch of different mutations as well, too. If I'm looking at epilepsy, if I'm looking at a couple, you know, some of the skeletal dysplasias, I might do a small gene panel. Large gene panels, if I'm going to look like I'm looking at um, developmental delay, something like that. I'll look at a few more genes. And then you go up to what is currently what I would call the big dog technologies, which are whole exome and whole genome. Cost obviously goes up with these things as when you increase the number of genes involved. And it actually goes up for the re not the reason you would expect. Uh, this is another thing I'm required by union laws to show you, which is a Moore's Law curve. Everyone who does a genetics talk will show you this one. I think Chris Austin, when he was here, showed you the same graph. Actually, this is Chris's slide, so um, he loaned it to me. Basically, the cost 
pervasive DNA sequences dropped drastically over the last uh, 20 plus years so that now you can do a whole genome basically for around $1,000. Now, that sounds great. Wow, $1,000 for a genome. I want one of those. There's a problem. That's $1,000 to run the chip. So what does the chip do? Um, this is old Sanger sequence, which most of you who studied in medical school and high school know that you use terminators to clip off an extending piece of DNA. The terminators have dyes on them. You read the dyes, you get a squiggly line sequence. I actually go back to when we used to do these by autoradiograph. Modern uh, next generation sequencing, there are a couple of different techniques that are used. The one that's most commonly used is one developed by a company called Illumina where you fragment your genomic DNA. You then put binders on the end of that DNA, affix it to a surface, and then you basically run little itty bitty small sequencing reactions in place, taking image photographs as you go along, which gives you this sort of uh, psychedelic galaxy appearance here that changes as you add the terminators on and change the color and allows you to read the sequence going down that small fragment. So in a whole genome, that means you're basically getting billions or at least millions and millions of small fragments that you have a little bit of sequence on. It's kind of like um, taking a paper shredder with a phone book in it and then shredding it up, and now you've got to put all the pieces of paper back together. And that's literally what you do, is you actually take all those little fragments and you line them up, and then you get your sequence from that. When we're doing whole exome, we do it a little bit differently. Before we run that sequencing on the next generation platform, we use things called baits or probes to pull exons out of that fragmented DNA. So we've enriched it so that the sequences we're reading are primarily just those of the exons. Because remember, then we've gone from the whole thing down to about 2% or less, which is, has a lot of benefits to doing it that way. Now, the biggest problem these days in doing uh, DNA sequencing is actually data analysis. So the first thing you have to do, and what you'll find is you'll, you'll get folks report back and they're getting a quality report on the sequence. So how well did those probes pull down? How well was the read on all those little dots? Could you get good resolution on those? Then you have to take all those little pieces and line them up. And the thing is, you've got to make sure you do it with redundancy because you've done this on a bulk basis, so you usually want multiple reads on each of those little gene areas. You want sometimes as many as 100 or more just before you'll even really trust the data that much. So you line up all of these reads on the computer, which can take a while to do. And so the, the rate limiter actually becomes data processing. So the images from these can be anywhere between two and 30 terabytes for storing the images from a single sequence run. Um, we can reduce that by just after we've aligned all the sequences down to about 1.5 gigabytes for your genome. We'll fit, so it'll fit on your modern flash drive pretty easily here. If we just take what you're different from a reference sequence, you can get that down to about 20 megabytes of data where you're doing that. That's 20 megabytes of the differences between you and a reference sequence. So that's just generating the sequence. And those of us who's worked with this for a while know that that technique can go, you have to have incredibly good quality control. We're lucky here we've got a great molecular genetics lab. They tend to be very careful to make sure whatever they're reporting out is rock solid, but you will get a lot of labs that will kind of rush through these things, and sometimes you'll get results that can be a little difficult to interpret. Um, so what things will you miss? So things like where you have repetitive DNA sequences that expand or contract, which is a lot of neurogenetic diseases. Fragile X is another one like that. But there are a number of Huntington's, things like that, where you expand or repeat. Those are not picked up well by sequencing. Copy number variants, a lot of the sequences won't necessarily pick those up. So that's why we still use our microarrays. Long insertions, places where you've got a big chunk of DNA that's been changed, mainly because the sequence can't bridge that with those smaller fragments, structural variants, things like that. And then, of course, always epigenetics. We always throw epigenetics as the end because it's not going to pick up the methylation. There are new techniques coming along to do these things. So actually, my field is getting more complex, not less for interpretation. So diagnostic clinical whole exome sequencing, um, what do you end up being concerned with? So if I sequence your whole genome, I'm going to find about four to 10 million variations in you from the norm. A bunch of those we're going to know. So we'll filter out a lot of that stuff because it's a variant we already know, about 85% of those 
we've already cataloged and we don't think they do anything. Remember, remember that phrase, we don't think they do anything. Not they don't do anything, we don't think they do. Because we make a lot of assumptions when we start interpreting DNA data. Um, what we end up looking at is we end up looking at rare variants that we don't normally see in the population. And then uh, de novo variants that we know from looking at the code will affect the protein structure. Just simply because we have so much information we have to filter through. Now, what's the problem with this with rare variants? What's one of the unique things about DC? We have a lot of international populations. What I can tell you is most of those international populations, the variants that are common in those groups are not well characterized in the reference sequences that we use for a lot of the interpretations we do. So we kind of call this the interpretive dance portion of DNA testing. Or storytelling is the other one. I'm a southerner, so we like storytelling. But it kind of comes back to the old phrase, know what you know. If we know a variant causes a disease, that's good. Know what you don't know, we get variants with unknown significance, which literally means we think it might or we think it might be associated with, but we're not really sure because we don't have concrete proof. It's the what you don't know, you don't know that will get you in trouble because when I tell you I've done a whole exome sequence, do you think I've actually sequenced every single exome in the human genome? The answer is no. Have I actually pulled through every variant I found in that exome? Absolutely not. My filters have to take a lot of those out just simply because you can't process that much information. You take that up to the whole genome level and then you get an even bigger problem. You have to set your digital filter so high that your odds of a false negative actually get quite high. So the importance of definitions. Uh, those of you who've been around a bit, you used to hear the term polymorphism and mutation used a lot. And we used to distinguish those. We've kind of gotten away from using those altogether pretty much. Polymorphism used to be something that was present in more than 1% of the population or 2%. The mutation was a bad thing. The problem is those definitions are kind of irrelevant now. We kind of just call them variants. So for instance, um, Things that will affect one situation or can be bad can be actually good in another. Um, the sickle cell mutation in the middle of the malaria belt actually can have a protective effect. However, if you uh, have two copies of it, then you have sickle cell anemia. Those things balance out. The hemochromatosis change is actually in 10% of some Caucasian populations. It, it causes a known disease in older age, which used to not be an issue. Older age is kind of a modern invention. Um, so that one definitely goes past being a polymorphism. It's quite common, but yet also has a deleterious effect. So this is kind of what it feels like some days. This is the Human Genome Project and Interpretation. We keep looking for edge pieces uh, in this pile. Occasionally we find one. Uh, what we do, though, is when we try to pull these things together, one of the biggest efforts around modern genetics is actually pooling data. This is one field where it's absolutely crucial. Whenever we find a variant or a change that we think causes a disease, we try to get it out and share it immediately. So first off, see if anybody else has seen the same thing. Uh, to also see if anyone else has got any bright ideas or has even tested this. One of the big fields now is actually taking genetic variants and disease genes, or what we think are disease genes, and actually seeing if they cause a disease. You'll notice the reports that you get back from molecular genetics labs are full of what we'll call weasel words. Almost everything, that, unless they are rock solid certain, it causes the disease. They'll say it's a variant of unknown significance, may be predicted to have a deleterious effect on this gene, and then they'll give you some reasons why, what databases they compared it to, things like that. And if you don't read those reports carefully, it's really easy to blow past that and think, okay, that was just a side finding they got when they're actually saying is, we think this is it, but no way are we going to put that in black and white ink on here saying this is it, because we could be wrong. So there's lots of these different databases. We participate in the ClinVar. Oh, man, there's lots and lots of digital. Without the modern digital repositories, molecular genetics would be pretty much a useless science, because you literally often cannot tell unless someone's gone there before that one of these uh, variations actually has an effect. But internationally, this has actually become even more important. So there are large efforts going on in Asia, the Middle East, um, some in Africa and South America to actually backfill all the variations. You figure if everyone's got about eight to 10 maybe variations from the normal, eight to 10 million variations from the normal sequence, 
actually cataloging all of those is a massive undertaking. It's going to take a lot of time. So you'll hear things like the Thousand Genomes Project, things like that, where they're actually trying to backfill this data. The next step to this, though, to make it useful is then we have to take all those variations and say which ones have a clinical effect. Right now we're doing that kind of what I would call the single gene level. So you find one change, does that have enough of a factor to have an effect? Where it gets really challenging is when you have multi-gene effects on a particular condition. It's like looking at the world's biggest uh, slot machine uh, and what are the lineups that will actually pay out to give you a phenotype on that disease. So what we do at Children's is kind of a neat way. So Christina and the molecular team came up with a neat idea. Instead of trying to do a specific and custom chip for all the different diseases we do, they actually do one chip. So we use the same sequencing technique on everyone who gets sequenced here, whether they're getting a few genes or all of them, because the chip's the cheapest part of it now. The most expensive part is actually the interpretation of the sequence and trying to figure out what it means. So the fewer genes the team has to analyze, the better off they are. So we use the same chip. So they, what we're currently using right now is a Mendeleone. That's three-year-old, four-year-old technology, so it's already completely obsolete. We need to actually get up to the next level, which is whole exome, which they're planning to roll out next year. But they'll actually, we'll do what we call a personalized sequencing panel. The ordering physician selects which genes they want looked at. You know, if it's cancer genes, you select the cancer panel. If it's connective tissue, you select that. Those are the genes that are brought through and analyzed. Now, there's actually sort of a hidden advantage to that. If you follow ethics and molecular genetic testing, which I'm sure you all do, you'll know that the American College of Medical Genetics put out a somewhat controversial uh, policy statement a few years ago that unintended findings or there's a set of genes that you should always report the findings back to the patient, such as, you know, hereditary cancers, things that would have a clinical effect on that patient. So if I'm testing a newborn and I find out they have something like Huntington's, I have to report that back to them. You know, that kind of gets a little bit sticky with some of those situations. The PSP panels actually pretty much don't interpret those genes. So the only ones that actually get uh, lined up, reported, and analyzed are the genes in question for that patient's um, particular findings. So there's a few advantages to doing it this way. The other thing that's nice, though, so let's say you don't find what you needed to in that first set of analyses. We actually have all the sequence uh, images back there. We can go back, reanalyze, pull out other genes that might be uh, interesting for that particular patient, and look to see if what's going on. When we switch over to whole exome, then basically we can actually default to a whole exome analysis if we don't find what we want. Interestingly enough, though, in these selected gene panels, about 80% of the time, that's where we find what we need. So actually, this pre-selection of genes saves on um, lab time, saves cost by doing it that way. I'll just go through there. This would be a typical one for dilated cardiomyopathy. And these panels will change every day. That's why the fact that we're using a common chip and a digital panel makes a lot more sense. I can guarantee you, since this slide was made, three more genes have been added to this. Uh, and it happens all the time, because people make new association with genes in clinical disease. All right. So. Uh, when we looked at uh, the first 250 patients that we ordered whole exome sequencing on, this was actually published um, by Yang et al. This was at a different laboratory. Um, when they looked at 250, they found 86 mutated alleles that were highly likely to be causative in 62 of those patients, so about a 25% yield. That's actually fairly typical. When you start going to next generation big sequencing in a patient, you're pretty sure has a genetic condition. That's when most people go. About 25% of the time, you'll find what you need. Even if you go to whole, and you think, okay, well, if you go to whole genome, does the yield go up? Actually, no, it doesn't. Typically, with whole genome, the yield can actually go down from those patients simply because filtering all of those things, really, you lose a lot of what might be in there. So we're still not at the point where we can diagnose everything, but we can get pretty good with these. The biggest problem we have right now is pushback. So. Genetic testing has evolved incredibly rapidly over the last 10 to 20 years. I mean, the stuff we're doing now, we couldn't do five years ago. You know, the concepts didn't even exist 10 to 15 years ago for some of the sequencing modalities we use. Most of these tests are in not FDA approved. The chromosome microarray is. None of the next generation sequencing is. 
but they're all done in CLIA labs under very high standards. So they're highly reliable, but how do you take a test that's going to change in six months and run it through an FDA process, knowing you're going to have to do the same thing again right after that? What we get pushback from from the insurers is, well, this isn't an FDA-approved test. And I had a um, peer-to-peer recently with one of our insurers, and I said, well, I want to run a panel of about 250 genes for this patient with this condition. He said, okay, I need you to walk me through each gene in that panel and tell me how that's going to affect your treatment decisions. And I said, you're not, I'm not making this up. This, we get this on a routine basis. It's a giant game of chicken. They don't want to pay it out. I, you know, don't blame them. They want to hold the money. Um, and we've got to try to figure out how to talk them into doing it. I think it's an evolving situation. Like I said, genetics is in a transition period right now. I think with time that will improve as it has with other genetic tests in the past. But right now it's kind of a pain. Um, for fetal structural abnormalities, our yield for sequence tends to be about uh, 10 to 20 percent. So we can actually usually find a candidate gene in about, um, <clears throat> about 20 percent of patients we look for on those using a whole exome sequencing technique. For autism, about 20 percent of the time, we'll find something studies vary, but 20 percent is not a bad number to use when we're going through and doing molecular testing on these patients. Uh, with intellectual disability, and it's actually about 16 percent, if we actually take patients who have non-syndromic developmental delay, in other words, their development is delayed, but otherwise they look fine, significant number of those folks will have either a defect on a chromosome microarray or a defect in a gene affecting, affecting brain development. So things that don't affect your appearance but affect your function quite significantly. And then the cancer ones, it kind of gets all over the place. It depends on if you look at the tumors or you look at the patient. Interestingly, a lot of the familial cancer syndromes don't necessarily have a high penetrance. You know, go back to BRCA testing. Everyone thought when we found the breast cancer genes, that would explain a lot of what was going on there. Actually, for familials, it's maybe 5%, 10% of that. So there's still a lot of things we don't know about that, which is a fertile field for research. All right. So a couple of things I'd like you to remember when you want to do molecular testing. A genetics consult is cheaper than a genetics test. Uh, having one of us come by and see a patient costs about 350 bucks. Doing the testing can cost as much as $10,000 or more. And sometimes I've seen that build up to even more than that. You have to do genetic counseling before one that you do testing on a family. Why? You have to manage expectations. Um, most families think of DNA testing as magic. We tend to think of DNA testing as magic, that it's always going to give you an answer that you're going to be absolutely certain of. And that will happen occasionally. More likely, you're going to get an answer back that says, we think this is the change that caused this disease, but no one's actually ever really proven it, but it seems likely. Or you'll get one back saying, well, we found some changes, but we don't really think any of them necessarily caused this disease. So a lot of this is we're still doing that backfill to try to get some certainty about what these different changes do. So the changes tend to be vague, and that takes a while to explain to a family that they're going to get a test that they may get a very ambiguous answer on, particularly when it costs that much. The other thing you have to remember is you've got to have a follow-up system. These things can take a couple of months to come back sometimes, just simply because the data interpretation takes so long, and you've got to manage the family's expectations. So we sort of use a 1.5 to 2x rule. You tell the family it's going to take about one and a half times what it's going to take, because otherwise at noon on the day you told them it's going to be back, they're going to be on the phone wanting those results and the lab may or may not have gotten it back to you just yet. Um, so, but also, you don't want to make sure things uh, fall through the cracks. I won't name the service, but we had two kids tested for Fragile X a few years ago who were positive that no one ever followed the results up on. The parents had had subsequent kids. Fortunately, the dice came up the right way both times. They did not have another child with Fragile X. But you have to make sure you follow up on these things. Unlike most laboratories, what you're dealing with here is what you would think of as permanent information. You know, when you do someone's sequence, it tends to say the same for the rest of their life. If I do a sodium, and I do a sodium later in the day, they're likely to be different. If I do a DNA sequence, given some caveats on that, it's likely to stay that way um, for the rest of their lives. Um, anticipate ambiguity, we talked about that. And give the lab as much phenotypic information as you can, because they've got to have something to hang those variations on. You know, if they find, you know, if you tell them the patient's got 
you know, two arms on one side of the body. They're going to look at things that affect, you know, how do you mirror image uh, development, things like that, as opposed to just saying, just do DNA sequencing and tell me what you find. Well, they're going to find all kinds of things. The, the old joke in, X, in uh, next gen sequencing used to be the answer is always yes, but you have no idea if it's the right yes or not. And that's where having more clinical information is important. So this idea that genetic sequencing would do away with the need for a good physical exam, absolutely wrong. Actually, the physical exam and the phenotype becomes more important than ever when you're dealing with DNA sequencing. The other thing is we don't sequence everything. Even with whole genome, even with whole exome, there are areas that don't get picked up. All right, I'm going to skip the cautionary tale from the Mayo Clinic, but summarize it by saying they put pacemakers in several family members based on a change they found that they thought caused long QT syndrome. It looked great on paper. They put the pacemakers in, found it later on that the change they had didn't cause long QT syndrome when they looked at it at the molecular level, expressing it in cells. So even when we think we know what we're doing, we don't always know what we're doing. All right. I want to talk about rapid uh, whole genome sequence, mainly because Billy Short's sitting here and she asked me to. Um, this is something you'll see a lot of press around, is we're going to turn around two to three day rapid whole genome sequencing. So from a technical standpoint of actually getting DNA sequence out of that, that is challenging but not an impossible thing to do. You can do it in a couple of days with an all hands evolution to do it. The problem is, is how are you going to interpret those 10 million variants that you're going to pull back from that patient. That's where it gets really goofy. They have to, they use the digital filter system to do it, and they have to set the filters so high that your likelihood of a false negative is almost overwhelming in those. Uh, they did one study uh, that they published where they said about 65% of the uh, whole genome sequences we did on patients changed the management of that patient. Well, what they counted was 30% of them then went on palliative care. That's probably going to be obvious whether you've got the DNA sequence back or not. 5% of those that affected outcome resulted in a patient transfer. That was what they called a clinical actionable item. Um, and 20% got a med change, and 20% got genetic counseling. So you have to be careful in how you read these things on what the clinical effect of that doing. Not that many of them actually changed base management, and a lot of them were conditions that you could pick up either with a chromosome microarray or also with uh, whole exome sequencing. Baylor's uh, College of Medicine has kind of led the way on next-gen sequencing. Talking to them two days ago, what they really liked in the newborn period is a rapid whole exome. You don't have nearly as much data to go through. Your false negative rate is going to be a little lower on those things. Um, I just like showing this one. This is the Rand Corporation's idea in the 1950s of what the future home computer would look like. Seriously, that was, and it was going to be easy to use because of the teletype and the fact that it could use Fortran like programming language. All right, I'll, do, I'll cover one other thing and then because I want to make sure we stay on time. Let's talk about cell free fetal DNA. This is another big test that's being used in OBGYN. A lot of controversy when the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology started recommending this for all early pregnancies. Now, the nice thing about this is it's actually pretty accurate. So the false uh, negative rate is quite low on this. It's very good at picking up aneuploidies, uh, trisomy 21, 18. It's not quite as good yet at picking up single gene defects, things like that. The problem is it's got a high false positive rate. So if you're screening a high risk population, its positive predictive value is about 80%. If you're screening a low-risk population, young moms, things like that, the positive predictive value of a positive test here is only 50%. So what um, the CDC recommends very strongly is use this as a screener. A lot of practices were using this as a diagnostic and then proceeding either to termination or other things. What the recommendations are now is that it be used as a screener and that you confirm with a secondary test in some way, in the amniocentesis, CBS, that sort of thing. So that's one that's out there. You'll see a lot of stuff on, but has a kind of a little catch at the back end of it. Um, I promised you some uh, recreational genetics. This is my genetics origin. Interestingly enough, as you can see, all of my DNA, once it got here, circled around Tennessee and Alabama and uh, North Carolina. We don't get out much genetically, so to speak. And to no surprise of anyone, I have a higher than normal concentration of Neanderthal DNA. 
Mark Batchel will not be surprised at that in the least. And as you can see, my ancestors wandered a lot. All right. This is kind of my final advice to you. It's a transition technology right now. It's incredibly useful. It's a very exciting time to be in this field. But there are things this technology will and won't do. If you're going to go into the forest, take a friend. In other words, call a geneticist or a genetic counselor to go with you. And with that, I'll take questions. Mark, I knew you would. Thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, um, my question is, uh, can you, uh, for our residents, uh, basically say what they should do when they see a child who has autism or who has developmental disability? Should all of these children now uh, be referred to uh, genetics? Uh, what, what should we be doing? Uh, you're asking me the easy question. What I would, even though um, it adds to the wait times, which I don't like to do, at this point, Mark, I'd say it's still advisable to have genetics or genetic counseling involved because the yields on a lot of these are a little unpredictable. So I would say involve genetics at some level for this. I'd say a lot of these patients now get tested and should, probably should be tested. For instance, uh, non-syndromic severe developmental delay without a good reason. You know, the patient doesn't have a history of severe hypoxia, ethanol exposure, things like that. You probably want to test those patients because you may find something that's either going to affect that patient's future children or may have uh, implications for the rest of the family. So I'd say a lot of those kids should get tested now. What I hope is in the next five, ten plus years um, that we actually get that to the point so people can order it as a routine test. I sort of feel like we're in genetics in the position of being midwives right now. This is a difficult delivery. It's a confusing situation. Hopefully, as these things sort themselves out, then the utility of this will go up so that folks in any field can use us. And you're seeing that already. You know, the epileptologist will order an epilepsy panel. The cancer docs know what to order. The folks who do arrhythmias know what to order. When you start getting into neurodevelopment, it gets a lot grayer. Um, but I still think that patients benefit from it. So I think what I would suggest is they call one of the genetic counselors, talk it through with them, see if it's a good family where testing may be of use. Steve. Marshall, thanks uh, so much for that. It was uh, highly intelligible. Uh, I understood oh. it, which is saying a great deal. I feel much more up to date. Um, I want to riff a little bit further on Mark's question, which is um, the idea of how often should a child uh, with a, a autism or with a undiagnosed genetic epilepsy see you? Because obviously the database and your ability to discern right. a discrete diagnosis um, becomes better every year. So if the initial workup for a genetic epilepsy is negative uh, today, yeah. should they see you again in, in two years, something like that? And that's actually, I could have, I'm, I'll slip you a 20 later for asking me that question because that's really one of the ones you want to think about. How often should we reanalyze is actually what you're asking me. One of the advantages to the approach we're using here, rather than using a fixed panel that only has those genes in it by doing either the Mendeleome or the whole exome in the distant, not too distant future, is that data is still in the background and you can go back and reanalyze. And when they look at patients from, you know, five or six years ago and they reanalyze, you can add another 25, sometimes 30 percent to your diagnostics. Um, Somewhat you can claim it's higher than that. You get into a little more speculative stuff. So it's not even so much how often should they see us, it's how often should the laboratories reanalyze their data based on the phenotype. And one of the things that then really becomes important is having a really good phenotype and then knowing you know, when to look at those things. So that is once again sort of in flux as far as how we're doing that. With a patient uh, you know, a non-dysmorphic developmental delay patient who at this point has negative molecular, the secondary yield is probably kind of low. A patient, though, who may have one or two features, um, some of the autistic patients, probably useful to see every four or five years. The question you have to ask yourself then, what, will that change anything drastically? In other words, is there an urgency to it or more just the fact that it's useful to know these things? It depends. It depends on what the genetic changes and what the effect it has on the patient. So. Um, I would certainly say that every couple of years, a lot of these should get reanalyzed if they haven't, even patients who have a positive diagnosis, because uh, things may have changed. What we once thought was a definite yes 
on that was a molecular defect. Later on, they find that's not. Um, long QT is a great example of that. About 30 to 40 percent of the patients that were getting diagnosed with that by genetic testing end up not actually having long QT. I know I wasn't that clear, folks. It must be early and you haven't had your coffee. Marshall, also, thank you so much. Um, with this field moving so quickly, with new important variations being identified every week, how do you, what, what, what are the tools you use to keep up? I hire really smart young faculty members. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, are there data, are there yeah. databases that you yes. it's all digital constantly now. visit all the time? And, yeah. and um, if, what, what if a those? geneticist is not using his computer to help him diagnose stuff, he's not trying very hard. Now, we have sites like Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man. There are ClinVar databases that have the clinical variants that have been spotted. We actually end up being actively involved in the interpretation of molecular data for these patients. Having said that, every single geneticist on the planet is behind because the, it's all moving forward so fast and in, the, in kind of different shifts, one area will move ahead here, another will move ahead here. If you think you're up to date on everything, you're wrong. So it's, it's actually one of the things that keeps me awake at night is did you miss something? Well, you know you did. You just don't know what it was. Marshall, I loved it. So thank you so much for oh, offering this today. Could you tell us one or two initiatives that will be coming out of the Rare Disease Institute? Sure. Um, actually, a couple of things. One is standardization around diagnostic approaches. So one of the two main focuses of the Rare Disease Institute are improving treatment, but also improving diagnosis. Um, if any of you remember the show House, I hate that show because it's like, oh, I have my brilliant idea. I'll do 10 tests, then go think about it, and then you know, invade someone's home or something like that, and then have the next brilliant idea. That, that is a very inefficient way to diagnose these patients. One of the things we find is we can cluster our patients around presentations. We can develop algorithms for how to work those up that have the highest yield. And then eventually you filter down to those few patients where you just can't come up with a diagnosis. That's when you you know, dig in really deep, but you know, 80 to 90 percent of them with a rationalized approach, you can get to, so that's one thing we'll be working on. Um, that's also one of Nord's big pushes to working with us on that. And then as we build the network out to other institutions, we'll work on standardizing that across the board. That's one of the other is standardizing treatment. So um, Mark can tell you this from urea cycle disorders. Before 2000, everybody did something a little bit different. Then we locked everybody in the basement of a hotel, which actually now probably sounds creepy, but, um, and then got everyone kind of on the same page. And what you can do is show measurable improvements in outcome for those patients after that, simply by organizing how you're doing things, rationalizing. And this isn't new. We're stealing from cystic fibrosis on this. So we're just applying it to a lot more conditions. So those are two things that come out of the RDI that I think will have a direct benefit for patients. Obviously, we also coordinate well with the molecular lab. We're looking forward to them uh, kind of coming up to the next level, which is whole exome. Marshall? Uh, yes. That was great. Thanks. Um, it, we have a very rich uh, database here and, and a large service. Do we regularly contribute to the other databases? Yes. Variants? Our stuff all goes into ClinVar and everything else. We're also doing some background research on it. So, for instance, there was a paper that came out about two years ago showing that a or suggesting that a polymorphism in the methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase gene was a predictor of autism. So we had, you know, a couple of thousand sequences on patients here, many of whom have autism, many of whom don't. We actually looked at that variant in there and showed it actually didn't contribute to that. So not only are we have things going on at the individual level and we populate back. In fact, actually, one of the recommendations in our field is you don't use labs that don't contribute back because they're they're just not, those are not the players you want to deal with. But we're also doing some meta research as well, too, to kind of see what's going on with the patient. And with that, I think I've used up my time. Thank you all very much.